Please turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, we'll read a couple of verses there, verses 6 and 7, and then we will turn to Colossians 1, Colossians chapter 1 in the New Testament, and read a bit more from that passage. So first, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, and then Colossians 1, 15 to 23. This is the Word of God. It is inspired breathed out by God himself, so it is profitable for us for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. So let's give ear to it this morning as it is read. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell." And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. O Lord God, we do thank you that you've given us your word to reveal to us who you are and your will for our lives, particularly your will for our salvation. We ask that now as we turn our attention to your word that you would add to the reading of your word, understanding that we might follow you better, that we might obey you, that we might love you more. Thank you for showing us yourself in these words today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So perhaps uh, you can settle a dispute for me that uh, the first service was not so helpful in. Um, Nothing against those folks. But... um, So uh, when it comes to gifts under the Christmas tree, are you allowed to shake them to find out what's underneath, what's in those gifts? So, okay, if you're a shaker, then raise your hand if you think that's okay. And I could have guessed some of those suspects, like that guy. Uh, But if, if thou shalt not shake the presences, the 11th commandment, raise your hand. Okay, well, it's weird because the first, first service, they were all shakers. They, were, they, they must go to the first service. Well, some of you have probably already placed presents under the tree, and they've probably already been given a good shake, either by you or by your kids. And uh, the whole idea behind that is to find out what's in there, right? To try to guess what's, what's, what am I getting for Christmas? Well, one commentator on Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7 commented that these four titles of Jesus, of of the coming Messiah, of the the king that God's people need, these four names are like uh, descriptors that help us understand, help us see uh, this greatest of all gifts that we've received. So wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We get 
we get a description, we get more revealed to us with each name that we're given. But this name, this, this one today, Everlasting Father, is perhaps a little bit more difficult or maybe even reveals more than the others do. Uh, it makes us think and wonder about this gift that has been given. It reveals to us that we've got to think outside the box. Because far too often we put God in a box or we put Jesus Christ in a box. We've got them all figured out, right? We know who he is. We know, we know what he means to us. But when we come to this name of Jesus, our thinking is shaken up a bit. Everlasting Father. Jesus? Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, right? He's the Son of God. So how could he be Everlasting Father? Certainly Isaiah messed up when he, when he threw this name in there. It should have been Everlasting Son or something to that effect. But Isaiah tells us here that this Messiah, the one that would come, this king that we need, is everlasting father. We don't generally think of him that way, and that's probably good. We think of him as the son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, and that's, that's a right way to think of Jesus Christ. Um, in fact, he's the one who taught his disciples that we have one common father, when he prayed, Our Father who art in heaven. But these names, these uh, terms, these titles that are given in Isaiah 9 6 tell us more about the Son. They reveal to us things about the Son. These names, these descriptors reveal to us the miracle of the incarnation that God is indeed the one who took on flesh. Now, this name, more than the other three, might uh, make us think more when we come to it. Uh, when we think about wonderful counselor, we get that. Or mighty God, that's understandable. Prince of Peace, which we'll look at next week. That's, that's great. That's what we long for is peace. We, we love it. But everlasting Father kind of throws a little bit of a curveball at us. And then we think about what Mark and Lucas have taught us the last couple of weeks. When Lucas taught a couple of weeks ago on Wonderful Counselor, we get that, right? That Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the plan of redemption. He fulfills the plan of redemption. Uh, mighty God, he has the, the power, the ability to, to pull off the plan of redemption, to bring about this reconciliation that we need between ourselves and God. So we get those. We get Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Again, Everlasting Father is a bit troubling, but we understand when it comes to this plan of redemption that, that he has this, this attitude or this bearing, this, this spirit of being a fatherly person, this fatherly savior that, that wants to protect and provide for his people as a father would. So we see that in Jesus. And this name of Jesus shows us this. Well, this is what we, we need to walk away from this passage with or this understanding of the name of Christ, that you are sons and daughters of the Father because of the life and death and resurrection of our everlasting Father. You are sons and daughters of the King. You are sons and daughters of the Father because of his life, because of what he did in his life and his obedience, what he accomplished for us in his death, and what was promised to us, the hope that that we're birthed into because of his resurrection. Your everlasting father is the one true God of Israel who has come in the flesh so that we know God the Father, so that we're reconciled to God the Father. And so our, our three points this morning as we walk through this, this passage and, and the message today is very simple. It's just simply looking first at the Father and then second, at everlasting. And then third, that Jesus Christ is your everlasting Father. And maybe drawing a couple of implications from that. So first of all, then, Father. Now, when we hear Father, when we think about Father, that's often shaped by our understanding of who our Father was, or perhaps the kind of Father we have been, if you're, if you're a dad. Um, 
That's often how we get the impression, our understanding of who our father is. Uh, But in Isaiah's day, the idea of father was associated with, with strength and stability and success and protection and those kinds of things. To be fatherless in those days was, was to be without hope. It meant that you really had no, no place, no belonging, no, no um, uh, security resting in a people, right? To be fatherless uh, was, was hopeless. And Mark uh, reminded us of, of our, our need to care for the, the fatherless in that sermon that he preached the, the week right before Thanksgiving when he talked about justice and our need to care for the fatherless. Fatherlessness is, is terrible, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a bit, but um, it, it means having want, having a want of hope. And so uh, we'll come back to our, our everlasting father in a bit, but remember, uh, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father that Isaiah is describing here is that king that, that we need. It's that, it's that father of the nation that we need. Re- remember, um, we looked at I- Isaiah chapter 6 a few weeks ago when Isaiah is called by God to be a prophet. And the, the marker for that verse is the beginning where it says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Well, King Uzziah was really a great king. He served for 52 years. He built them into a prosperous nation. But then he failed. He failed at the end of his reign. He, he entered in, in prideful uh, exuberance into the Holy of Holies, a place he was not to go to offer sacrifice, to offer incense. And he was struck with lep- leprosy, and he died of leprosy. So he was not the king that the people needed. Ahaz, the, the current king, when Isaiah is writing this, was a scoundrel. Right? He, was, he was outright a bad king. He did, evil what was, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not uh, follow the ways of his father David. And uh, Ahaz, uh, he, he gave his, his nation to other nations. He built these alliances, these allegiances with other kings. He trusted other kings instead of being the king that he was meant to be. So there's a gaping leadership vacuum in Judah and God's people knew it. And so God uses, God uses Isaiah to speak to his people who have taken on this posture. They are they're entrenched in their rebellion. It's like when I was a little boy and I would turn my back to my dad and just like clench my fists. And then I, I realized a little bit later in life, actually after I had kids, that that was probably not a great posture to turn my back to my dad because he probably wanted to kick me in the butt. Uh, and he did apply some heat to the seat on occasion in my rebellion. But, but he, also, he, he also did this. So he, he applied heat to the seat when I needed it. But he also took me by the shoulders and would turn me and pull my chin up so I'm looking him in the eye and instruct me in my wrongdoing and in my need for repentance. And it was there, it was then, that I, my heart was won over. And on occasion, at occasion, it, it ended in an embrace. But that's what God does, that's what God's doing here for Judah. He's taking this rebellious fist clenched at the side, I'm not going to do what you want, to, want me to do, turning turning them back to him with these names was saying, no, I am going to provide for you this one, this, this king who, who you may have hope in, that your hope may rest in this one. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. That's the father we need, is that father that, that pursues us in our sin, in our, in our rebellion, and turns us back to him. That's the kind of king that you have. That's the kind of king that you serve. In Jesus, but as we think of Father a bit more, we think of we think of Father in three ways. Um, uh, we think of him as patriarch, right? The 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 head of the family, the the Pater Noster, the right our Father. He's he's the one that leads the family. Um, he's the one that's head over the family, the originator of the family. We think of fathers in that way. Uh, In the Hebrew, the word that we come to for father in Isaiah 9, 6 is abi, 
uh, where we get words like Abraham or Abiathar, some of the kings, the priests. Uh, that word Abi means father, and it's, it's used over 250 times in the Old Testament. And one-fifth of those times is in the book of Genesis, which tells us the story of who? Of the fathers, of the patriarchs. That's what Genesis is all about. And when we think of father, we think of this, this ruler over the family, the one who sets the rules, the one who sets the law, the one who brings order to the family. That's what a father does. So that's, that's part of what we understand about being a father. And we know that many of the kings, as I have said, uh, of Judah and of Israel, did not serve their people in this way. They were meant to be The father of the nation, like we think of George Washington, right? Who's the father of the United States? Well, that's George Washington. Well, we think of that uh, with our leaders. And and, and Israel was to think of that with their kings. As I mentioned before, Ahaz did not do this well. 2 Chronicles 28, 1 says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David has done, had done. Ahaz was not the patriarch, not the father that he was meant to be. He was not the, the, the king that God's people needed. He was their head, but he was not a good father to them. The father is also protector. The people of Israel, the people of Judah, look to their king to be their protector, and rightly so. We think of that as fathers, right? Protectors of the realm, they, they protect the family, they protect the home, they protect the household. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's no surprise that they looked for security and safety from their king as a protector over the nation. Do you remember when, um, when Abraham left his father in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12? God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees to go to Haran and And he left his father, he left that place of security, he left that place of safety to do what God had called him to do. I remember remember, um, 12 years ago when my father passed away that I had this sensation that I've found is not so unique of all of a sudden when when my dad died, this, this kind of like shield or protection or umbrella or covering over me was not there any longer. I, my father was, was gone. He was, he was in heaven with the Lord. But now I became the head for my family. It was, it was kind of, even though I hadn't been in my father's home for over close to 30 years, when, when my father died, this kind of sense of covering was gone. Well, that's the idea. We, we have this idea of of fathers in that sense, protecting us, guarding us, keeping us. And we have that view of of the king. The king is meant to do that. The father is also provider. The father was provider uh, not just of safety and protection, uh, as we've just mentioned, but also of anything that's needed to cause his household to flourish, anything that would cause the household to advance, anything that would cause the nation to advance. So, in Isaiah's day, the, the responsibility of the father was much like ours to make sure the, the kids have clothes and you got food on the table and uh, all the basic needs of life are, are, are provided for. But the, the father's role was also that of priest, right? To make sure that, that uh, the right sacrifices were offered on behalf of the family. And the king was responsible for that. The king was responsible to make sure that sacrifices were offered for the nation, the right sacrifices in the right place as God had ordained. But what do we read over and over with these kings? Oh, they, they removed all the, all the bales and now all the astroths, but they left the high places. Or they didn't re- re- remove the bales and the astroths. They built more temples, temples like Ahaz. Ahaz traveled to Assyria to try to win the king of Assyria over to him so he could have an alliance with him. And he came back to Israel and said, we need to build an altar like they have in Assyria. And he offered up his child on that altar. That's not the king that they needed. The king is meant to, to, to do what's, what's called upon to bring flourishing to the family, to the nation. 
Well, that just wasn't happening with these guys. But Isaiah gives them a picture of one who would. He gives, holds forth this hope. Everlasting Father. He's patriarch, he's protector, he's provider. And the descriptor that Isaiah uses is everlasting. Everlasting. He's everlasting Father. Now, I think when we come to that, we have to think right away, how did Isaiah pick these descriptors to go with each of the titles? Like, wouldn't it have been great if he just said, he's wonderful father? Wouldn't that have given maybe a little bit more sense of calm or peace to the people? He's going to be a wonderful father? Or, um, or mighty father? Like, my dad can beat up your dad? Kind of thinking. You know, I need that kind of father. I need him on my side. But he says, everlasting father. Father, everlasting Father. We'll come back uh, again to consider uh, what the Holy Spirit's at work here doing because we, we have to come back to this. Isaiah is trying to present to the people of his day uh, a king that they could hope in, a king that they need. And for the Hebrew people, kings were so transitory, so temporary. If you read through the books of First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, you hear about the the the, the kings that uh, came on be, became kings, sat on the throne uh, for a number of years, and then they did such and such, and then they slept with their fathers, or they were buried with their fathers. They're so transitory, but this king, the child that would be born, the son that would be given, the the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, would be everlasting father to this nation, to these people. He would not be temporary. He would be from forever. He would be an everlasting king. That's what is promised by Isaiah. Think about how astounding that statement really is, that a child born into the world is called everlasting. This child, this one, would not come into existence when he's born because he is everlasting. No ending, no beginning. This is the the pre-incarnate Christ who would become flesh, who would take on flesh, who would be born as a baby. Could Isaiah have said in any more certain terms that this child, this one born to them, would be God himself, God incarnate? He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And not only is he eternal in his nature, but the realm over which he reigns, over which he rules, is eternal. Isaiah 57, 15 says that God inhabits the eternal. He inhabits the eternal. He, he lives in the eternal. He lives outside of time. He lives outside of, of uh, any of the rules that we have to follow regarding time. He He goes beyond those. He does not change. He does not get older. He does not get younger. He does not get frail. He is the way he is. He operates in the realm of the eternal. His love for his people is an eternal love, and the life that he gives his people is an eternal life. So does everlasting refer to his nature or to the nature of the realm over which he rules? And the answer is yes, both. He rule, he, his, his nature is everlasting, his rule is everlasting, and he is your everlasting father. This one Jesus, this one who would come, this one born unto you. And that's what Luke says, right, in chapter 2 of, his, uh, of the gospel, that famous Christmas passage, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is where we we turn to Colossians chapter 1 to see this one who is Christ the Lord. Verse 15 of Colossians 1 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus perfectly images the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3 says that He is the exact imprint of His nature or the exact representation of His being. Jesus told his disciple Philip, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. As your everlasting Father, Jesus Christ is your 
patriarch. He is the one who gives life to his people. He's the one who creates a people for himself. He came to gather a people for himself. He came to die. He came to save a people for himself. He is your beginning with God. He is your true patriarch, the father of all who are living. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He is father of all the living before, from before the foundation of the earth. Before that foundation was laid, he was the father of all his people. He gives eternal life to his children. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. He is preeminent. It says here, the, he, um, before, for by him all things were created, heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So he is above all of those. He is the one who is preeminent above all authority, all powers. Any power that you feel is opposing you, he is over. He rules over that. Kind of going back to what Mark, how Mark preached that last part of his sermon last week with Christ having ascended on high and ruling from on high. And no matter what force, what principality, what power comes against you, what of it? You have victory in Christ. You are overcomers in Christ. He is head over his church. He is head over every single one of us. He is the head. He is the patriarch. He is the progenitor, the creator of the church, the originator of, his, of the body of Christ. By his spirit, the church, the body of Christ, the household of faith brings, uh, springs forth from him like a fountain. He gives life to his church. As, as your everlasting father, he provides for all of your needs. He's your provider. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. All the fullness of Christ, uh, of God, dwells in Christ. In becoming your king, your head, the child born unto you, the son given to you, you have all that you need. You have all that you need in Christ. His provision for you is found in that most important of places where he provided reconciliation between you and the Father. That was the plan. That's what he came to do. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to the Father. And he has accomplished that for you. He is your provider. He's put you in a right place before God. And this this king is still at work in your heart. He rules over your heart. He is causing you by his spirit, training you by his spirit to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You are now able to say no to sin. In fact, uh, that could probably be stated a little bit more directly. Because you are now able to say no to sin, you must say no to sin. You must say no. He trains you, the Spirit trains you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present day. It's Him at work in you to do these things. You are, as Paul said, a sweet aroma of Christ to God. You're an aroma of Christ to God among among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. He is your everlasting Father making you a sweet aroma to God in the midst of a crazy, mixed-up world. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And I think, I think of Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, where it says, and these are verses that are probably familiar to you, it says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before you endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. Your 
everlasting Father has suffered at the hands of sinful men so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. I have grown weary. Haven't you? I hear it almost every day. I, I'm so tired of wearing masks. But I don't have the right to grow. I, I don't. I, Christ suffered at the hands of sinful men, probably more sinful than, than the governor or the mayor, probably more, gov, more sinful than the president. I, I don't know. It's, it's not on a scale, right? That's, he, he suffered at the hands of sinful men so that you would not grow weary or lose heart. The sweet aroma that we present to the world around us is that we do not grow weary. We do not grumble and complain. As far as I can tell, that's the only difference between Christians and non-Christians in the midst of what we're going through. We all follow the same guidelines. Christians are sweet about it. Non-Christians are not sweet about it. Isn't that the way it ought to be? We are to be a sweet aroma in the midst, what does Paul say? In the midst, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That's the only difference that I can tell between Christians and non-Christians. Christians do it with love in their hearts. Christians do it with a sweet aroma, making a sweet aroma that will make people sick, right? It, that, that goes on to the next verse. It's, a, it's an aroma that will make the perishing sick. But it ought, to be, it ought to be distinguishable how Christians live in this current age. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you would not grow weary or lose heart. I'm preaching to myself as much as you. I grow weary. But I, I look... I, I have to keep my eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed. Look to Jesus. Look to, Je Look to your everlasting Father. Now, as opposed to these earthly kings, this, this king died. This king died. Was placed right on top of his cross. King of the Jews. This king died. But, Different than every single other king that has ever lived, ever will live, this king rose from the dead. This king is not dead. This king is alive. This king rules at the right hand of the Father. This king is your everlasting Father. Your patriarch, he has given you life. Your protector, he protects you. Your provider, he provides for all of your needs. He is that one once for all sacrifice that accomplished all that was necessary for our salvation and for godly living. He is our provision and He is our protector. Uh, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you blameless and above reproach before Him holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all, the, all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, become, became a minister. When, when asked, what did Jesus save us from? Many Christians will rightly say, he has saved us from our sins, and He has done that. That is absolutely true. He has saved us uh, from the power of sin, from the habit of sin, from the effects of sin. But there's a greater answer to that question, isn't there? What did Jesus save us from? He saved us from the wrath of God due to us because of our sin. That is what Jesus has protected us from. That's what that whole word propitiation means, that covering. He is the covering. He is our everlasting Father. He, he 
is my covering. I can be safe and secure under him because he protects me from the Father's wrath. It says in this passage that by his death in his body, he presents us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That means we never know God's wrath. His wrath never falls upon us. We know his loving discipline, but we never know his wrath because Jesus has protected us from that. And he continues to protect us from from our enemies. He continues to to, uh, protect us from all of his and all of our enemies. Jesus takes, when it says that, that alienation, talks about the alienation, he takes the alienation away from us and God. He, he makes friends of his enemies. What, what better way to provide protection than to make friends of of God's enemies. He makes us God's friends. He reconciles us to God. We are now hidden in Christ. He is protector. So we, we shook the box a little bit today. We shook our thinking a little bit today. Everlasting fathers, this, this Savior of ours is, is fatherly in, in how he saves us, how he cares for us, how he rules over us as the perfect king. He is your everlasting Father. And one final application. Uh, This is from the preface of Senator Ben Sass's book, Them. Today, 40% of American children are growing up without a dad. That cuts across all races, socioeconomic classes, geographical areas, and every other distinction. It's even worse among younger adults. When a woman aged 30 or younger gives birth, there is now a majority probability that that baby will have no meaningful, consistent connection to their father. I can think of no greater looming crisis for, in American life than this spiking fatherlessness. Our next generation is being hobbled in ways that we can only imagine. There are obviously many single mothers out there who do a wonderful job against the odds, but American men are drifting away from their ultimate responsibility at an alarming rate. We are setting ourselves up for a generational crisis, and I pray for the kids who find themselves in this situation through no fault of their own. They are going to need our help. So if there's a a practical way that that we understand the fatherliness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that Jesus is our everlasting Father. There's a practical way for us to make good on this with others, and that is that what we know, what we flourish under, this is the King who causes His people to flourish, what we flourish under is meant to be extended, meant to be shared with the fatherless around us, that they would know the Father through the life, death, and resurrection of their everlasting Father, that they would be sons and daughters of the King as well. And so perhaps, perhaps God is putting it on your heart today as you hear this message about our everlasting Father, perhaps He's calling you in some way to extend that fatherliness of your Savior to someone around you, someone in our community, that you might help know the Father. Let's pray. Father, we we are flourishing under your, your fatherhood and under the fatherliness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our everlasting Father, We are so blessed, and we are blessed even just to be able to be here this morning to gather in in worship um, over technology, live streaming, and and in person. We are so blessed, and, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. You have brought that about. didn't happen by chance. It wasn't because we're so ingenious, but you have blessed us with this. May you use what we've known and learned and been blessed in to call others to do exactly what we've done, to become sons and daughters of the King through confessing our sin, repenting of our sin, knowing the forgiveness of our sin through Jesus Christ. 
May we bring others into a relationship where they also know you as Father because of their everlasting Father. In Jesus' name we pray.